In this Elden Ring video, I'm going to be showing you my Sorcerer build, which is an evolution of the Mage build, and is sort of a level 50 build of how you would play a pure Mage. I've done videos previously on the Spellblade and Enchanted Knight, which are sort of two melee Mage type builds, but this one is a pure ranged build, and I will show you how it plays around this level. Okay, the first thing we're going to talk about in this video with the Sorcerer build is staves, which to use. In my opinion, you should already be using the Meteorite Staff. This has S scaling, and the Sorcery scaling on this will just continue to do very, very well the higher your intelligence goes because of that S scaling. You can't upgrade this weapon, but you don't need to. It does very, very well until late game. So at this point in the game, you should be using the Meteorite Staff. If you've been using the Demi-Human Staff, or if you're using the Academy Glintstone Staff, or some other staff, at this point in the game, you should switch over to Meteorite. The Meteorite Staff will carry you until you can use the end game Staffs, which mildly outperform this Staff. There's really no reason to use anything else but this Staff, so if you don't have this Staff, go ahead and go get it as quick as you can. All we're really concerned with on the Staff, for the most part, is the Sorcery Scaling. This is the number on the Staff that increases with your Intelligence. So the more Intelligence or less Intelligence you have, the more this is going to change, and the better scaling you have on a staff, the more this number will increase or decrease depending on what your intelligence is. Meteorite staff has S scaling. So that's top tier. Like you don't really get much better than that. You know, as you upgrade some of the other staffs in the game, they will eventually get to S tier and they may outperform the meteorite staff, but it's going to be a long, long time before they get there. So you should be using this until you reach end game. If you have two staffs that have the same sorcery scaling and everything else is equal, they're going to do the same damage for each spell. It doesn't matter what the name of them are, how much you've upgraded them. It doesn't matter. There are other passive bonuses, for instance, like the Meteorite Staff Boost Gravity Sorcery. So the Rock Sling spell, which you use with this build, is going to be boosted additionally on top of that Sorcery Scaling, making this staff better for that spell than maybe some other staff that has the same Sorcery Scaling at its upgrade. And there are other staffs as well that have bonuses to certain Sorcery groups. So if you find yourself using like a particular group of sorceries like the Carrion Sword Sorceries or Carrion Sorceries, there's a staff that boosts those specifically. So if you end up getting it to the same sorcery scaling as Meteorite Staff, it's actually going to outperform those. So with this build though, it, we've used spells from all different schools and we use Rock Sling. So Meteorite is the best choice until you get to the very, very high intelligence requirement spells. Beyond this, the other weapon you're going to want for this build is a dagger. It doesn't have to be a dagger. It should be a light bladed weapon in order to use determination because I think it has to be a blade weapon in order to be buffed with determination. But you want to put the Ash of War determination on it. You want to hold it in your right hand and the staff in your left so that when you use L2, you can buff yourself with determination. Now, if you don't attack anything with determination, like if you don't poke anything with your dagger for that 10 second period that you're buffed, you are actually going to buff your spell damage by 60% for that 10 seconds. Even if you hit something with one spell, you can keep hitting them as long as it's in that 10 second window, and this costs 10 FP. So it's very, very situational. You're not going to use it all the time because it's not cost efficient, and a big part of playing a mage is being efficient with your FP so that you can make it to the next checkpoint and not run out of FP. But there are some scenarios where it's really good. For instance, if you're going to be spamming spells, like in a very uh, a boss fight or a tough enemy, or maybe you need to one-shot something because it's really dangerous from far away with Loretta's Great Bow. You can buff before you use that because Loretta's Great Bow costs like 26 or 30 FP or something like that. And this costs 10, so you're getting a 60% increase for 10 FP versus casting the spell twice and once after the enemy's already been alerted. So that's really, really good in some circumstances. And you're going to want to get in the hang of buffing yourself with this when you need it and not buffing yourself when you don't. As I mentioned, a lot of playing a mage is trying to figure out how much FP does it going to cost you to defeat an enemy type. And you'll learn this as you play the game and as you upgrade your spells. But you want to try and use the minimum amount of FP to kill enemies as possible so that you're not overkilling them with so much FP that you're constantly out of FP. You're obviously going to have your flasks skewed towards the FP side of things, not the health side of things, to give you uh, an opportunity to replenish FP more easily. But you don't want to cast like three rock slings at an enemy if you can cast two rock slings and one determination because that's actually 8 FP cheaper. So there's some math involved here and you kind of adapt as you go, but learning to figure out how much FP you can kill an enemy with the least is a big part of playing a mage build in uh, Elden Ring. The three talismans you want for this build are the Graven School Talisman, the Radagon Icon, and the Blessed Dew Talisman. The Graven School Talisman boosts the damage of your sorceries by a small percentage. It's not very much, but every little bit helps. 
And Radagon Icon is used to increase the speed at which you cast spells. It doesn't do it again by very much, but every little bit helps, and especially when you're spamming spells. I put up a little bit display here on the screen so you can get a comparison of it with it equipped and with it not. It's not a huge amount, but it does help. And the other talisman I like for this part of the game is the Blessed Dew Talisman. This slowly regenerates your health over time. It's not very good for boss fights, but it's excellent for exploration, particularly when you're loaded up on the FP side of things flask-wise, and you take a little bit of damage and you're like, should I drink a potion and waste one of the few that I have so that I don't get one shot like randomly out of nowhere by something? Or should I wait and hope I don't get one shot? Like, you don't want to be in that scenario. So the Blessed Dew Talisman heals up that little bit while you're exploring so that you can, you know, save that healing potion for when you really need it. Another decent choice for this build, if you don't want that, is the America's Scar Seal. This talisman increases your mind, intelligence, faith, and arcane. You don't really need the faith and arcane, but the mind and intelligence is nice from it to give you some more FP and to give you a little bit more damage. You do take more damage from wearing it. It's not a lot. But it's also a good option if you just want to try and get a little bit more damage out and you're not so worried about healing yourself. In terms of armor, I really like the Queen's Crescent Crown here. It increases your intelligence by three. It's pretty lightweight. It doesn't have any downsides like some of the other, like Burger King heads, I call them, um, that like reduce your health by a lot or your stamina by a lot in order to increase your intelligence. I really don't like that because you're already going to be low on HP anyway because you're playing a mage and you're not trying to get hit, even though we do boost vigor. Uh, and so reducing that even further puts you kind of in the one-shot territory where you might get one shot by some of the boss attacks, and you really don't want to be in that range. And as far as the rest of the armor goes, I just like to wear the heaviest I can wear in still medium roll to get as much protection as possible. To carry a knight set's kind of nice, it looks kind of cool, but you can use whatever you feel like here. Okay, let's talk about the spells a little bit. The first one is Glintstone Pebble. You should have been using this from the beginning of the game. What's great about this spell is it's cheap, and it has very good range, and it can be spanned. You're going to use this spell through the entire game. It will literally be the staple of your build through the entire game. And I'm sorry to disappoint you if you've been playing a mage and you're like wondering how much variety you get. You'll be sad to learn that throughout the whole course of the game, you'll probably use this spell more than any other single spell in the game. And it just has so much application because of its range and its low cost that it's very, very good. The next spell that I like for this build is very, very situational, is Great Glenstone Shard. And the reason it's very situational is it has a lot higher FP cost, even though its damage is more substantial than Glenstone Pebble, and it has a much, much shorter range. What I like using this spell for is very aggressive enemies, particularly ones that try to get to you in melee very quickly, and that don't dodge. This is a better way of getting damage out faster than spamming Glenstone Pebble when things are charging you because you're doing about double the damage. Maybe not exactly double, but about 70 to 80% more damage than a Glintstone Pebble, and you can cast them at almost the same speed as Glintstone Pebble. So if you need to get damage out quickly because something's charging at you in your face, then Great Glintstone Shard is the way to go. The next spell is Glintstone Arc. Again, you've probably been using this since the beginning of the game. Another very situational spell that's very good at AoEing enemies. You don't have a lot of AoE with the way we're set up, but this is a very good AoE spell for packs of enemies. There are parts of the games that are like clusters of enemies, and this passes through enemies. So it doesn't just hit the first one and stop. It goes through the whole pack and it spreads out. So it's very, very nice in those situations, and you'll be glad you have it slotted when those situations arise. The next spell we use for this build is called Rock Sling. You can get this from Kaled. It's very, very easy to get. And this spell actually does physical damage, and that's fantastic because there are a lot of enemies, particularly in the Learning of the Lakes area, that are magic resistant. And this allows us to deal substantial damage to those enemies where we might have a harder time with Glintstone Pebble or, you know, another spell that does magic damage. So you definitely want this. It's very, very good in the Renala fight. And again, if you buff this with, like, Determination and then just spam this during the Renala fight, you'll absolutely obliterate her. It's very, very strong. It's also further boosted by the Meteorite Staff, which works really well with this as well. And the last spell we use here is Loretta's Great Bow. This thing has tremendous range and pretty good damage. You can absolutely cheese just tons of enemies, particularly out on the landscape with this spell, uh, where you just stand like right outside their aggro range and wait for them to retreat and keep spamming it. So if you're having a hard time with some of the bosses on the landscape, this can be a uh, game changer for you. And if you're in, you know, a legacy dungeon and you need to get something that's sniping you or is very, very far away, it's really good. And remember that you can buff with Determination before casting it in order to increase its damage by 60%, which is absolutely fantastic. 
Talking about attributes for a second, we have 20 Vigor here, 20 Mind, 14 Endurance, 18 Dexterity, 33 Intelligence. You probably don't need that much Dexterity. This is kind of left over for my Spellblade build. So if you have like 14, 15, 13, 12, whatever is fine, whatever, you know, for Dexterity, you're not really trying to increase your cast speed much with this build, at least at this point of the game. You want more damage. So you could probably swap out 5 points there in Dexterity and put them into Intelligence or Mind. Keep in mind that uh, Mind, once you hit 20, like, 20 mind from 21 onward you get way more you get like double the fp per point so you really definitely want to get from like 20 to 30 mind pretty quickly because that's going to almost double your fp which is huge so keep in mind that you know even though it might not seem like it early on mind gets just better and better throughout the game we also have 20 vigor there for health to make sure that we don't get one shot at it obviously you're not planning on getting hit as a mage you could go glass cannon if you want and dump the vigor and put it into intelligence so that you're killing things but mistakes happen, and you want to make sure that you don't die from that mistake. As long as you can live and take a potion, that's good enough. And it will be really annoying if you don't have enough health to survive a lot of one-shot attacks, which is what we have it there for. And intelligence is obviously self-explanatory. It boosts the damage of your spells by increasing your sorcery scaling, and it also is the requirement for a lot of the sorceries in the game. So you're going to need to keep increasing this as much as you can. That wraps up the Sorcerer video, and that should be the last of our mid-game builds. I might squeak out one more. I haven't decided yet. A surprise video. We'll see. But otherwise, we're going to be moving on to our advanced 100-level builds, so stay tuned for those.